Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfi, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and Truth Crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. Hey, before we get started with today's show, I just want to draw your attention to new merchandise. Funkin' Stuff and Truth and Rhythm designs are in, and they look pretty darn cool. So show your support, help support the program, and show off some stylish merchandise and apparel. Only at the Funkin' Stuff store. I am pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership. Joseph Bowie, a trailblazing trombonist and vocalist who since the early 1970s has pushed boundaries and challenged himself and listeners alike with bold, thrilling musical explorations and discoveries. Among his notable achievements was founding the avant-garde punk funk jazz collective known as Defunct, which since 1980 has released eight studio albums along with several live recordings. Springing forth from St. Louis with a father who was a music teacher and two older successful horn playing brothers, during his multifaceted career, Joe has played with dozens of highly regarded musicians from jazz and a multitude of other genres. Some of the more famous names include Ornette Coleman, Nona Hendrix, Vernon Reed, Ronnie Drayden, Tyrone Davis, Albert King, Edith James, Yusuf Latif, 7-Eleven, Dr. John, and Candy Dolfer. Joe, thank you for joining the show. How are you? Hey, Scott. Thank you. Very nice. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you. And where is here for you right now? I'm in, I'm in Holland, actually. I live in the Netherlands, uh, a small town called Horticum, which is about uh, 45 minutes from Amsterdam. Holland is a small country. Um, everything is pretty close by, but uh, I choose to live in smaller towns at, at this point in my life. I've done enough big city work. <laughs> Never had the pleasure of uh, traveling there, but I hope to one day. And uh, you've been yeah, there you for... Love it. What, you've been there for, what, 15, 20 years now? Oh, uh, well, 17, almost 18. I came, well, I came in 2003, I moved here. And I married my wife, who is Dutch, and we got married in 2004. Uh, so I've been here yeah, about 18 years now. Yeah, geez, Christ, time flies, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure, yeah. That's right around the time, actually, uh, 
that same year I had my only one and only son. And that time has gone oh. by so fast. Congratulations. Well, they did. I know he's not a baby anymore. <laughs> no, no. I kind of keep reminding myself, especially when he borrows the car. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So, um, it, it must be an interesting experience, you know, coming from the middle of America like you did and then viewing America from the outside, you know, especially when we've gone through these crazy things like, you know, the Trump presidency and Black Lives Matter and all that stuff. Right. It's, 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 it's quite interesting, to say the least. Uh, yeah, I mean, America, it's, it's, it's nice to view it from, from the European side because it's a completely different picture than most people have in America of Americans. Uh, so fortunately, I've been traveling throughout Europe since the early 70s. Uh, actually, I've probably toured more in Europe than I have, uh, than I have in the States. I toured well, a little bit in the States in the early 80s. I mean, we did some things with uh, yeah, Talking Heads, Clash. We did some double bills with the Clash, Talking Heads. And uh, I did a bill with James Brown at uh, Paramount Theater in New York, I think about 89 or something like this. And uh, But anyway, as, in a whole, I've been working in Europe because I moved. I went to Europe in 1971 with the Black Artist Group, Oliver Lake and the Black Artist Group. And that was, uh, we went to Paris. So that was my first exposure to Europe. And ever since then, I've been uh, spending most of my time in Europe. And finally, I decided, well, I should just move here. Well, I've always gotten the sense, especially um, from the 80s on, that it seemed like a lot of European areas and, and Japan and things like that almost appreciate jazz and R&B and funk more than a lot of Americans do. Well, absolutely. I mean, and we can even go back further than that. I mean, think about it. I mean, black artists uh, from, uh, we go, well, let's talk about Donald Summer. Let's talk about Josephine Baker. Let's talk about uh, Slide Hampton, Dexter Gordon. All of these musicians moved to Europe well, in the first part of the century. Uh, so there, there's a, it's always been an appreciation for jazz and creative music and uh, uh I would say a, a more tolerance for, for black artists and appreciation for black artists from, from the beginning, from the twenties. I mean, think about it, Josephine Baker, uh, Paul Roberson, these, were, these people made it in Europe. And this has always been going on because America's always, you know, been sort of like a closed, uh, the perfect country, but, in a way that, that, that enclosed it, that encapsulated it into, a, you know, like America only. I mean, and you, yeah, you think about that Trump crap, but uh, that's the way it was. I mean, uh, Americans didn't realize that there was anything else to the world but America. But as we know, it, it changed a lot. It changed a lot. Uh, I mean, I think about the early days when I was touring with Defunct throughout Europe. I mean, America, especially funk musicians and jazz musicians were a real commodity. I, I've just always been uh, gratified that uh, there's such appreciation overseas and abroad for the music that I love so much. You know, even if sure. uh, uh, the, the labels and, and radio and stuff sort of turn their back on it to a large extent uh, domestically, you know, so... Yeah. Um, but Joe, you're, you're, you know, uh, I wanted to uh, make sure that listeners and viewers are aware okay. of some of the uh, information that's out there on the internet on you. They can easily get a lot of background information on Joe Bowie and all that you've done. And I encourage them to do that right. for our right. conversation today. You know, our time is what it is, but I want to make sure that I really uh, get into certain areas of your great career. And, um, you know, we know so much about your jazz and RB foundations, and I mentioned some of those. But I really want to know, Joe, where did funk fit in for you? You know, in the late 60s and 70s, what mm. was the funk influence? Who were your yeah. idols? And how did that get into your, your mix? Okay, well, let's go back to, I mean, I was born in 53. So I sort of came to my own in the 60s. I grew up in the 60s. I was a, a you know, preteen in the 60s and a high school. And, uh, but... 
But a great thing to remember is this was at the same time, this is before the Civil Rights Act in 64. So I grew up in St. Louis, which was a very segregated town at the time. And uh, well, I was connected to the South. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to say all this to say that we had black radio and white radio. Uh, so I listened to yeah, black radio. That's what that's the only choice we had. Well, K A T Z Cats or this was the radio station I listened to as a teenager. And uh of course Motown, James Brown, Asley Brothers, all of this black, great black funk music, Ohio players, brass connection, every uh all of these groups. Commodores, all of these groups when I was growing up as a teen, this is what I listened to. I mean, I bought 45, Dyke and the Blazers. That was one of the early funk groups that I really loved, Dyke and the Blazers. Uh, uh, Cameo, actually one of Cameos of my, my, my granddaughter, is, uh, her father was a son of one of Cameo's band members. But anyway, uh, that's the music I grew up on. Well, that was black music, and uh, and and not by it wasn't so integrated during the sixties. You have to realize we, you, I listened to black music. I listened to funk. I listened to Motown. I listened to the Philly sound because that's the radio exposure we had. Uh, they didn't start mixing genres on the radio until I guess the seventies, maybe late sixties, when that when they they actually start merging. Uh, programming between black and white artists on the same station. But like I said, when I grew up as a teenager, that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. It was just black radio and there was white radio. Just like the, the first white people I, when I was a young kid, seven, eight years old, my father took me for piano lessons downtown St. Louis. And that was really the only time I could really see a lot of white people because we grew up in a black neighborhood. It was like apartheid. Mm -hmm. See, people don't realize that in America, America was like South Africa before the 60s. It's very segregated. And uh, yeah, so. Well, and St. Anyway, St. Louis is, is, is pretty well known for its blues and jazz, but I can't really think of, you know, funk acts that came out of that area. Were there any that kind of came out of the St. Louis area? Okay, let me think about it. Well, St. Louis, you're right. It's more blues and jazz, but and rhythm and blues. Like my my first sister in law was Fontella Bass. She she was the, the, the first wife of my brother. So that was R and B. That was funk. So I mean it was always a mixture of sort of R and B funk in St. Louis also. From Fontella. I mean, I played with Etta James in St. Louis before I with, with Albert King, who was blues, but there were all there were a lot of R&B blues crossover bands going on in St. Louis. I mean, uh, artists like Luther Ingram, uh, for instance, but he was more of a soul ballad singer. Um, let me think of some. Uh, I'm trying to think how how to. You know, obviously, goes. New York and Los Angeles and 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 Dayton, Ohio. These are sort of like hotbeds where a lot of funk uh, emerged from. So, um, right. at some point, you know, it definitely got deep into your bloodstream because you know it well, was going to come well, out that's a lot the music later. I love. I mean, I yeah. listen to George Clinton. I listen to James Brown and that whole hierarchy from Bootsy to George Clinton, the Parliament Funkadelic. All of that was my. Uh, well, and even to, to some of the stuff Miles Davis was doing when he got when he got funky, uh, I really loved. And see, that's why I have a sort of a crossover brain, and I like that mixture of jazz and funk, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or funk with improvisational, right, added to it. And I know uh, you're also a Hendrix fan too. So that's I'm a great saying. Hendrix fan. He was one of my. I mean, I was a rock and roll in the '60s. I was a Jimi Hendrix. I mean, I would die for Jimi Hendrix. And uh, when we were taking acid and all that crap back in those days. <laughs> but no, Jimmy was uh, also important, who was also a blues artist and an R&B artist, playing with the Isley Brothers in, in his early days and, and Wilson Pickett. Jimmy played with all of those R&B acts uh, in the early days. Did you ever get to see Jimmy play? I did see him one time in St. Louis. I always tell the story. Uh, 
And I was fortunate enough to be backstage. I was 15 years old. I was backstage. I was with an agent who had a connection, got me backstage. And I actually spoke to Jimmy. I said, Jimmy, what's going on? Like a little stupid kid, right? And Jimmy said, I am. And he, <laughs> and then he left and entered the stage. But that, that, he said, I'm going on. That's what's happening. So, but that was great. So I never forget that. Uh, and then he commenced to, you know, burning up the Marshall Amp right in front. I was like, ah, in awe, right? Did, did you ever get so a chance? I, so I like this. I always like this cross, this fusion. I mean, I always like the Jimi Hendrix thing, which which kind of merged the races. Not only the California funk, the Jimmy, the then with Buddy Miles, and then also the Sly and the Family Stone was also an important. Uh, I mean, uh, well, music has never been racist, so that's for me. That was a great opportunity to to mix people and to mix genres and to mix the grooves up. Uh, and even in the first def defunct has always been a mixed party, uh, racially, whatever that means. I don't. I hate to even talk about it like that, but that's a that's that's what it is. And. Uh, but that came from my exposure to Jimmy and Sly Stone, and I realized that the music has no, you know, it doesn't really have a color. It might have a genre, but it doesn't really, I mean, uh, anybody can play it if if you learn it. Absolutely. It's just all the preconceived stuff that's put on top of it. That's right. Um, and as far as the trombone goes, Joe, who were some of your uh, biggest influences outside of your family uh, in terms okay. of uh, players? Well, of course, when I when I began, uh, big influences were like J.J. Johnson and Kay Wending, uh, and later on, Slide Hampton, Julian Priester. Uh, uh, and, and then a lot of my influences were John Coltrane. I mean, uh, are not trombonist. Uh, but Lester, Miles Davis, these are the people that influenced me on a approach, especially Miles and Train. Uh, uh, and I sort of uh, approached the trombone more as, yeah, from the trumpet perspective, as far as range and so forth. And uh, and as far as fluidity, I always listen to Train, the Cold Train, and, uh, and all the jazz greats, uh, Sonny Rollins, Charlie Parker. But trombonist, I would say, uh, J.J., but my favorite Oh, my my peer groups are like George Lewis, Ray Anderson. Uh, these are some of these are the great Steve Ture, uh, uh Well, like the yeah, these are some of the greats. But influence wise, I would have to go back and say yeah, J.J. Johnson was the first big ah. That's what a trombone is supposed to sound like. When, when you were uh, gravitating towards funk, did did uh, guys like uh, Fred Wesley or Maceo Parker or guys like that have some influence? Well, absolutely. Well, Fred, he's the he's the funk trombone player, and we're actually very good friends. And uh, we did a show together. Maybe one of these days, I'll send you a little video with, in uh, in Germany. We did a show together once. I was with a German band, and Fred was the guest, and I was I was on the show. And that's Fred is such a beautiful personality such a beautiful guy and uh just warm and friendly and funky on the trombone he he definitely created that whole yeah uh, with james brown he he found that funky trombone sound uh and developed that that's all fred that's a, a unique fred uh style of playing and uh, of course fred wesley was he's the funk trombone player so how can I leave him out as a main influence? Great influence. Yeah, um, his style is um, so definitive to me, just the way he lays in the groove, you know? Sure. No, it's, it's a great, he doesn't play a lot of notes. It's just, but how he uses the chord and he just re, reiterates, reiterates, reiterates the, the groove, the sound, the chord, the three or four notes in that chord. He'll play those same notes over and over with with rhythm and it's so groovy so you know coming up in that musical household joe uh i'm sure uh there was an element of of competition 
uh, but also mm -hmm. probably some support, right? Can you just oh, uh, talk a little no, bit about that brother, dynamic and how that helped you? Oh, yeah. Well, my brothers helped me always. I mean, they, they showed me tunes. They would show me songs to play. Uh, they would take me to their shows. Uh, and when I was old enough and could play good enough, they actually hired me to do, like with Fontella Bass, I would do shows when she was in town, I would do shows. Uh, and later on, when my brothers uh, moved to Chicago and Lester became a part of the AACM, and Byron, my other brother was also in Chicago doing more rhythm and blues with Chess and Checker records. So, and Byron, my, my brother Byron was sort of like an R&B impresario. He was, he was playing with everybody, the Dales, uh, all of the, you know, the Black Acts, Gladys Knight, Temptations. He worked with all of those groups when they would do shows in Chicago or on the East Coast in D.C. Byron, he was the band director to do that because he, he came up in, a, in his early days, he was a ghostwriter with uh, George Rhodes with Sammy Davis. Mm -hmm. So that's where he really got his his training was from George Rose, from Sammy Davis' experience. But Byron had a hell of a, I mean, he could write his ass off. And uh, he played with every R&B notable in the Midwest and East Coast. But they helped me and they, they showed me their secrets. And when Defunct came to, uh, you know, came to life, they helped me with, with music. They played on a lot of early recordings. Byron and Lester actually played on several defunct recordings. And they supported me like that. And they always, uh, uh, especially Lester, just be yourself. Don't try to sound like anybody. Just sound like who you are. Create your own sound, your own voice on your instrument. And, uh, and in your band, to go further, in your band, create, create your own yeah, identity. And they were always very encouraging and very supportive for me to do that. That's phenomenal. Uh, right. Do you remember the point where you sort of uh, felt comfortable on stage? And did you have an outgoing personality or were you kind of reserved but came out on stage? Huh. Well, I mean, I've been doing it well, since a teenager in high school. We we had a top 10, top 40 band in high school. I played uh, school proms. I played all the events at the schools. I always had the band. And uh, from, from 15 years old, my band, the Paramounts, were, we rehearsed in my parents' basement every night after school. And, uh, well, after homework. But, <laughs> but so... I never really had the fear. I had a love of the stage. I never really had a fear of the stage. I just, yeah, I wouldn't say I was uh, reserved. I guess I'm not outgoing, but on stage, I'm a firecracker. So that's when I really come to life. But I've never had any fear of the stage, no. Hmm. I love it. <laughs> it's apparent, yeah. Um, so what was... Uh, you know, a couple of turning points in the late seventies that ended up in defunct coming to fruition. Okay. Well, well, you know, when I, I went to New York with Charles Bobo Shaw, we were in Paris and then we left Paris, left the black artist group, went to New York city. This was in 1973. And uh, we had the human arts ensemble, which was a band led by Bobo, which sort of was, Jazz, but we also cross over and play some sort of kind of poppy sort of songs too. We we the, the genre started to shift. Uh, later, it developed into myself and Luther Thomas and Bobo did the St. Louis Creative Ensemble, which was more of a jazz group. But still, we started to explore some poppy songs, some blues, and some pop songs. And actually, that's when I first sang a song, uh, I Can't Figure Out. This was on a, a song with the St. Louis Creative song, Ensemble. And that's when I decided, I said, well, you know, if I want to be in the funk, I need to sing. So that's when I started singing. Soon after that, uh, 
after I left New York, went to Chicago for a year or two in uh, 76, 77, uh, worked with Tyrone Davis band. I was his band director for a year and a half or so. Then I went back to New York and it was the new, the new wave, no wave was going on. And uh, James Chance asked me to, uh, you know, put a horn section together for his band. James Chance or James White, whatever alias you want to know him as. So I started working with James and eventually that evolved to where he, I created my own band to open for James at these clubs like the Mud Club and uh, Matches Kansas City, Traxxas, uh, Dance Interior. So I started opening for James with Defunct. And soon Defunct became a sort of entity of his own. But that was all due to James White. James White introduced me to this kind of freed up, kind of flexible scene of uh, funk, punk, no wave, punk rock, whatever you want to call it. And that's where it began. And then I kind of embellished it into more of a, or of a jazzy funk band, Defunct. But Defunct began as an opening band for James White, James Chance. And uh, were, were you thinking mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, I'm not hearing anything like this and, and I want to put my stamp on it? Well, I wanted to, I wanted to have my own version of it, of course. I wanted to do my interpretation of it. I mean, uh, the no wave was going on. And of course, we had the standard funk, like, you know, the, you know, the, the great funk that was going on. But I wanted to do something a little different. I wanted to integrate uh, avant-garde also into the funk. I wanted to place that into the mix so it could be better understood. As well as say, yeah, I wanted, but I wanted the music to dance. I want, I wanted the funk to be danceable. But I might throw a little, little avant-garde in there, blah, 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 just for flavor. But I wanted the music had to dance, so we had to have, we had to have a hard groove, a nice funky groove. And then, like I said, that's when I created my our own identity, so so to speak, uh, by fusing avant-garde, jazz and rock and roll was there any sense of uh you know anti-disco sentiment you know were you kind of wanting to rebel a little bit against that sure well, we hated disco i mean this was like uh well, it all went with uh, ronald reagan then a disco came in and then all of a sudden yeah boom 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 the beat just became uh yeah nauseating it just but well Mindless, yeah <laughs> that's what happened so yeah uh and so, how did how, yeah. how, how'd you pick the members that uh, were on the first record huh well the first record was actually like we uh, well some of the members i known from st louis like kelvin bell um ronnie barrage was a drummer that this is the first band then with new york musicians melvin gibbs uh martin albert and there was a German keyboard player named Martin Fisher, who was with the first band. And we sort of came together at the Squad Theater and sort of try out and creating songs. And we just started grabbing members like that, uh, whoever, whoever I liked. You know, whoever was fitting the, fitting the, you know, fitting the shoe. And, but that one, we, we, we rehearsed all the time. We were at the Squad Theater on 23rd and 8th Avenue. And uh, we rehearsed there all the time with Janos Gott was the, was running the place. And uh, and he also was a lyric writer for the, for those first songs. He helped, we co-wrote co a lot of lyrics together because he was a poet from a Hungarian poet. And uh, the Squad Theater was an exiled uh, theater group from Hungary, from Budapest, who exiled themselves to New York. So that day even makes it more, <laughs> more crazy. So we got defunct. We got Janos Gad. We got a, a exiled Hungarian group. We got James White. We got Sun Ra playing at the Squad Theater every Saturday. It was a, it was quite a scene. And we got defunct playing there every, every week, and rehearsing there almost every day. So it was quite an interesting scene. Right down the street from the Chelsea, uh, Mandy Warhol's old stomp the Chelsea Hotel. 
So, but that was, it was crazy times. There was a lot of fun, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um, sure. It's the golden era right there for uh, for that region. H- how did you uh, decide what would go on that first record? Did most of the tracks come out of like rehearsing or jam sessions? Or It came out of rehearsal. We created the songs, wrote the lyrics, tested them, rehearsed them. And uh, uh, my brother Byron helped with the arrangements, the horn arrangements. But basically everything came off the top of my head and the head of musicians. And when we liked it, we said, okay, we're going to use that. Uh, and we, we just, we formulated those songs in rehearsal, most of them, most all of them in those days. Events, then it evolved later to me taking more of an active part in designing the songs. But in the beginning, it was more, it was a collective. It was more of a collective. Uh, and then later, I, I mean, I wanted to stay in that funky direction. And I, oh, anyway, you know how bands go. You, you, people go different directions and they want to do this and do that. I said, well, go, because I'm doing this. And I wanted to keep it in my vision of funky jazz. Well, that first record, I mean, I love Make Them Dance. And that's, you know, stood the test sure. of time. And, and the title cut to funk. Those are right. two highlights Classic for sure. Show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know that that title song, "Be Funk," was the, the first uh, chili, Red Hot Chili Pepper song they they got from "Be Funk," and they 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 talk about that a lot because they used to come hear us at the knitting factory in New York, be right in the front line, and uh, I used to run in the Tetis and the uh, Flea at the, the Peppermint Lounge. They were trying to get gigs, and uh, so we all became friends in those days too, because when they were young guys, they because they're a little maybe a generation younger than me. I, I think not only uh, them, I mean, that was very overt, but I think also uh, groups like Fishbone and Primus and Tackhead and 24-7 Spies. Sure. You know, so many were influenced, I think, by Defunct. No, because we were one of the, we were actually one of the first, uh, I think we were one of the first, well, besides, uh, what is this other, one of the first predominantly Black punk acts bad brains would be yeah. bad brains that's what i was thinking about yeah. right they were actually the four and, and then we could go back to the chambers brothers too in in the in the east coast who drayton played with also so i it's sort of a conglomeration of all of that stuff it's sort of a potpourri of all of that yeah you know, a little mixing little east coast little midwest and uh See, what I brought to the East Coast was that hard, that hardcore funk, which was, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we started with, yeah, well, it started out a little bit different in the beginning because I didn't know where it was going either. Nobody knew where it was headed. So, but that's yeah. where it all began. Right? <laughs> How did you feel about the, uh, you know, uh, the result of the first record in terms of, you know, artistically and also reception? Well, a lot of people think that's one of the greatest defunct records ever. It was quality, it was great production. Joe Boyd was the producer with Island Records and uh, it was a great, and we got a good, hey, we got a good boost. We, we started touring the world after that, after that first record. Before we did the thermonuclear sweat, but that first record really got us on the map and and actually, we were working since Joe Boyd's record company was also based in London. It gave us an opportunity to start touring Europe. Even then, I mean, we were playing the Berlin Jazz Festival in 1981, and uh, and we were playing all the big venues in London, uh, the venue Hammersmith Palais, Town and Country. I remember I met David Bowie at the Town and Country one night. We hung out. Uh, this is another little story I like to tell. After the show, David said, well, come on. He had, he had like eight prostitutes. He said, well, come on, come hang out. I mean, wasn't anything sexual, just hanging out. And uh, and we hung out and they, you know, the girls were snorting cocaine and blah, blah, and me and David, we were just talking and uh, and that was it. And it wasn't, it wasn't about, and like I said, it wasn't anything sexual, but he liked to hang with and David loved black women too. So because he said, David told me, he said, Joe, tell the black girl, one of the props, he said, I want her. I said, Well, David, you can have her. She you have the money, brother. 
but it was it was just just little funny things that happened in those periods. Uh, but he's a very nice guy also. And later on, I, my brother left to do some recording with him also. Uh, the the buoy is sticking they, together. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> What, what, was there any time that, that you guys took the stage and maybe the audience wasn't really ready for what you're going to bring and they were just a little slack job? Oh, sure. Well, the first time we played, we played a festival in Wiesen, Wiesen, Austria. And good friends of ours uh, from other musical days, the Human Arts Ensemble, Fritz Tom was the, the promoter. We opened the festival and they hated us. They were like, what the hell is this? This is not jazz. But uh, but Fritz, the promoters loved us so much, they said, now we're going to pay you again, close the festival. And we closed it. And uh, the response was better. But they, they, nobody had heard anything like this uh, in Europe either. But they were open for it. By the end of the show, they said, oh, okay, this is not that bad. Okay. This is something a little different. And uh, but uh, yeah, that was that was the main time. Uh, the other time I can think uh, that was interesting, we opened for Prince at Club 7th Avenue in Minneapolis. They invited us to come do that show. And then it was our show in the beginning. So when Prince found out, he said he wanted to play. Because it's an East Coast thing, you know. We were coming from New York. So we played and we, I mean, we really kicked it. We hit it hard. And uh, and then when Prince came out after the intermission, he was like, he, the first remark he said is like, jazz is dead, which we were, everybody was like, what the fuck are you talking about? But <laughs> but anyway, that was, that's, that's another funny story. But and then he commenced to play because he was great. But uh, we had made our impact on him. Uh, the audience loved us in Minneapolis, which was his hometown. So. What, what, year was that, what, what year was that, Joe? Whew. That must have been late 80s. I don't know exactly. I, I have to find, I got to ask some of the band members who have better memories than me. Uh, so it, must so, have been, so uh, it was after Prince had hit it big already? Yeah. Okay. I mean, he was already big and popular. And mm. he actually, I think, owned this club. Mm. The club 7th Avenue. That was a... This was his hometown. That was his. That was his backyard, and he was already a star. Okay. Yeah. And he he looked at us like some kind of upstart from New York. These crazy upstarts. And he wanted. To, I think he just wanted to have a good listen and a good looking listen at the band. That's why he wanted to. I mean, he's a smart guy. He just wanted to check us out to see what was all the noise about. Yeah. Uh, he was right? always checking everybody out. Um, yeah, he's a smart guy. Listen, yeah. man. talented and smart. So um, the second record, you know, what did you want to do differently uh, when you went in to do that? And um, it certainly was, you know, a lot more to it. You had some great session guys come in. What was the vision on the second defunct record for you? No, you mean uh, the thermonuclear sweat? Yeah. Is that what we're talking about? Yes. Well, it's more like expanding and uh, started stretching it out a little more. I mean, well, Vernon Reed joined us on, that's when Vernon joined the band. Uh, to do that recording, um, and uh, and we but we still had, basically had the same defunct concept. We 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 did a tune, Blue Bossa. We did a standard jazz tune on that record, our version of it. And because uh, defunct has always been a mixed genre, we we play anything on the show. We play a jazz tune, we play a bebop tune, we play a funk, we, you know, we play a gospel, but but we. I wanted to elude freedom, freedom to, to play what you like, to play what everybody likes, to play different. We don't have to be, I didn't. Have, I never wanted to be stuck in a genre. Okay, well, you, you're not playing uh, traditional funk, so you can't do that. No, we can do whatever we want. And that was the whole idea with the funk. We just wanted to express ourselves in a lot of different ways because I, I like a lot of different kinds of music. Mm -hmm. And to put it in context for listeners and, and viewers, especially maybe who weren't around then even, you know, 82 is when that came out. And that was at a time when, you know, right. disco was gone, corporate music industry was really taken over and uh, yeah. funk even 
was having a hard time because um, the labels weren't really supporting funk very well at that point, and they're going towards right. synthesizers and away from real horns and towards right. electronics. Exactly. And um, you guys were like such a breath of fresh air, rebelling against all that and keeping right. it real music and keeping it creative and keeping it ve- keeping it varied. Right. And they also kept us down. Let's keep that in mind too. That's why we never. I never got the uh, yeah, the credit or the attention or the money that a lot of acts got. Well, that's well. There's some other reasons for that too. But we defunct was also you know sort of op- suppressed because of that too because of, of the openness. We were sort of maybe maybe we were a threat to the industry some sort of way. I don't know. Maybe they didn't want the influence of defunct to spread. Because it was it was against against the know, grain, big time. Against yeah. the grain, and who likes that? Well, business doesn't like that too well. The record companies don't look at that too kindly, to because uh, you you're screwing up their money. Then, uh, if, 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 yeah, they yeah they were even suppressing jazz by that point too. They were pushing towards smooth jazz, right? You know, and yeah shameful but anyway that's what happened that's what it that's what it was Scott. well on that record especially i mean i love do baby you know uh that is so funky down and funky yeah that's just and it's just pure it's just a breath it's a breath and it just that's how pure and simple funk can be and it, you have to appreciate funk in the simplest forms the breath and the one it's as simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let it take over. Let it right. take over. Yeah. There you go. So um, after those records, you took a bit of a hiatus. Um, you went out to the Caribbean and um, you cleaned right. yourself up and you became a right. fitness nut uh, and, and, and all right. that and, and discovered Buddhism. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, when you're actually um, out there and, and recharging that way, how, uh, much, how much did you actually spend with music during that period when you were, I know you weren't recording then, but. I wasn't recording. Well, when I was in the Caribbean, I mean, uh, I was, uh, there were musicians in the Caribbean. Uh, matter of fact, well, I, I'm thinking of a great saxophone player with Count Basie was living in St. Croix at the same time. And I would. I would go play jazz shows around the island. I mean, I would with musicians who were there. Uh, I, I can't think of the name. I'll think of the name before we get off. The great saxophonist that played with Count Basie. Uh, I can't think of it now. I'm sorry, but anyway, I'm just saying there were there were musical there were shows on the islands and on the boats on the tour boats. So I could find a place to play every now and then, a club to play in. Nothing fancy. Nothing for a lot of money, but to keep me active musically. So you kept, uh, you know, your your stiff upper lip and all that for while you're out there, and yeah, just kept it. You got to keep going because you never know when you got to go back. You got to still be in shape when you go back. <laughs> Ready for the, your, you know, got to be in, in shape to do what you do best. So you can't lose your 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 energy. Did, did you keep your ear out there at all of what was being done and played in and selling or do you kind of cut all that off? Well, I kind of, I would say partially, but not totally. I wasn't really uh, overwhelmed with what's going on and who's playing what and who's playing this. Because basically this was a time when I went to the Caribbean, this was early eighties. I mean, this is, yeah, disco had already infected the land. And uh, it wasn't much, yeah, wasn't much else I was interested in during those years. I'm talking about 83, 82, 83. Uh, what was going on? Yeah, disco was going on. and uh, But I didn't keep up with too much of that, no. I was more or less trying to get myself sane again so I could come back and, and start, you know, return to my career. Yeah, and trying to get healthy, and that was, and that, sometimes that overrides the musical concerns. What, <laughs> what, what, what was it about uh, the drugs that you know just uh, attracted you, and and just you know kind of 
got you uh, basically hooked? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. drugs were, it was, it was, it was, I liked it. It was nice. I mean, uh, at, especially at a young age, I mean, impressionable age, and, uh, and you don't realize how dangerous these things are until you, until it's too late. But uh, the drugs were, huh, I liked it. And that's what I tell people. Why did you do drugs? Because I liked it. That's why. <laughs> and why did you stop? Because I like myself. Mm, yeah. Do you feel like, though, it helped open you up to certain uh, experimentation uh, musically? Well, you know, that's an ongoing conversation. The drugs open you up and relax you. You know, when I was younger, I would have said yes. But now I would say no. Because without the drugs, I'm still as crazy as I was. So that wasn't it. But at, at that age, I thought it was. You thought that was it. Maybe that was the trick to get you involved in the drugs. Maybe that was the, you know. But now I realize it's better without drugs. <laughs> I couldn't do it with drugs now. I can't imagine being on stage stoned anymore. I can't imagine that. But uh, so anyway, it's just a different time period, Scott. I mean, uh, when you're 25, logic is one thing. And when you're 68, it's something else. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's just not logical. Uh, yeah, I don't see drugs as a, and I wish I would have bypassed it. Now that I look back, I wish I could have bypassed that period. because That took a lot from me. That took a lot of my soul. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, we're glad you came on the other side. That's for sure. I mean, that's. I'm thing. glad. I'm glad too. But and but like I said, there are no regrets. I don't regret having gone through that because obviously it taught me it taught me some things. And uh, but it's nothing I would praise. Like I said, I would uh, if I could do it all over again, I would do it without the drugs. What What made you decide towards the end of the '80s? Hey, I'm ready to come back. I want to come back. I'm going to come back and I'm going to do uh, that third record uh, in America. In America. Okay. Well, I have been getting myself clean. I have been getting myself in shape. Uh, I started, I run a, I think I ran my first marathon in 86 in New York, but uh, uh, I have been developing that. I started running in the Caribbean because I was working at a hotel, that Buccaneer Hotel, for a while, and uh, I would start, uh, I started jogging. And that really helped me. And then at the same time, I got introduced to Buddhism. And I was really getting myself together to go back. Yeah, you know, to go back to uh, make another record and make a, in America, which was, was great timing. Like I said, this was all about the Ronald Reagan period and uh, it was a, it was a protest. It was a protest song against America. Well, all of my albums are protest songs, so to speak. But in America was really, uh, I remember the first song in America is really says it all. And uh, with Ronald Reagan and everybody, everything that was going on, all of the, it's a lot more of it going on now, but that uh, shows me there's always been going on like that. Madness, politically, socially. Mm -hmm. So I got myself together and came back to New York in 85. And uh, I think In America was uh, done in 87. I think that's when that was produced. But that was great. I mean, we had uh, still the same record company, Joe Boyd and uh, Gene Crow with sort of a subsidiary of Island Records. And uh, it, it was great. I mean. It well, was an know, opportunity lot, to keep going, yeah. A lot of people the talk, I think they focus mostly on those first two records. But for me, I love In America, too. I mean, it has more of a um, funkadelic right. kind of edge to it with more guitar. Sure, more rock and roll edge, right? Yeah. But that's why I said that the record company sort of abandoned me uh, after that. I mean, I was, I'm, I was all over the place. I'm playing rock. I'm playing funk. I mean... They're like, Joe, make up your mind. What genre are you going to do? But I want to do, do what I want to do. I want to do all of it. Uh, 
But like I said, there are a lot of great people talking about those first records. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever even heard my most recent defunct record, Master Folk. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm impressed we'll with it. That. We'll definitely talk about it. I wanted every record to be a progression of my spiritual awareness and my social and political environment. Uh, I never make records. I, well, I should have. I never made a record that said I want to make a lot of money. I just make records that go along with my beliefs. So every record defunct is done is, is parallel to my thinking and to our, our existence, our place in time. And musically, Ronnie Drayden is on that record. Uh, how did you connect with him? Well, we connected with Drayden uh, in New York because in New York, you need a guitar player. Drayden was one of the mainstream funk rock guitarists, black rock guitarists in the New York scene. I mean, he, he, he had started his career playing with the Chambers Brothers. And uh, so when we needed a guitar, we, yeah, just, you know, it's a small town when you live in Manhattan. You so said, who's going to call? Call Drayden. And Drayden came on. We had Kelvin Bell in the beginning. So uh, Drayden came in. I mean, I had a lot of guitar players over the years. But Drayden was uh, actually was one of the mainstays. Ronnie Drayden and Bill Bickford, the two guitarists. Opposing styles. But I always liked that. I didn't like Guitar. I wanted two guitars that played completely different styles. That's always been like that since the beginning. So with Drayden and Bigford, this band was the longest touring band. Uh, Kim Clark, Kenny Martin, Bill Bigford, Drayden, and uh, sometimes Kelvin Bell was, was in that before Drayden. But then, then that band toured for maybe 10 years in the early 80s into the early 90s when the band changed again. And we went, I went more, uh, I think more commercially funky. I had a female vocalist did like 93, Scooter Warner, Kelly Say was singing. And the music was, yeah, I think it was more focused mainstream funk. Come Funky, I had a, a recording deal with Enemy Records. And we did, uh, yeah, Come Funky was a great record. I think it was a great record. I like uh, Sneakin' on there. Sneakin', yeah, that's a great tune. Richard Lampiece wrote that, right? He's another great guitarist in the New York area. Richard Lampiece. No, that's a great, I mean, that was one of my favorite records. Uh, yeah, sneak do 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 ba do ba do ba do ba do ba do ba Right. Yeah, that record is definitely brighter sounding and kind of more mainstream. Right, know. it was more mainstream. And people ask me, why did you go more mainstream? I said, well, I got to eat too. <laughs> Come on, give me a break. I mean, people are so critical. Oh, why are you doing this? I said, I like to eat also. I, I need a house. I got to pay rent. I got to do this and do that. And uh, But I like the commercial stuff too. I mean, like I said, I was a big fan of uh, well, all these great Ohio players, all these great funk bands. So I wanted to do something in honor of them uh, to pay respects to the, my forefathers, my, my four funkers. Yeah, I mean, as long as you keep it funky, I mean, just because it's a little different, you know, I don't consider it a sellout unless you completely abandon the genres, right. maybe, you know, and you didn't right. do that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, crisis too. I mean, uh, refuse right. to refuse to love. Um, and to love. Uh, next, you know, next, which later I got all these songs. Well, like next, I got all big. I, I did big band arrangements of all of those things. So I've, I've been performing all over Europe doing big band shows with those same songs. But anyway, go ahead. But so yeah. that's uh, groove. I faith. taken those tunes and exploited them every way I could. Yeah. Um, and then One World was even uh, a little jazzier, I would say, than uh, Come Funky or, or Crisis. One World, yeah. But that was also so really commercially oriented. I mean, more, more of a commercial production. 
and that was done in Holland, actually. We recorded that in Holland. Uh, yeah, so, you know, when you did that, you made some concessions to try to be a little more accessible in the sound. Did that actually pay off? Did you get any more sales or success or just kind of no, didn't work no. out? No, I, I, I think I was shut out. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I hate to say that, but uh, I, I enjoyed the record and I've been touring based on those records. And I could, I've been touring on reputation, not on uh, support from big record companies. I've never had that. Except in the first record, we had some support with Hannibal, Hannibal Records and, uh, and Island. But after that, I never had any record company support after that. I produced my own uh, live albums to keep Defunct alive over the years. I mean, after One World, that was the last studio CD we did until 2015. But I got maybe five or six live records that I produced to keep us touring. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinslift.net. Thank you very much.